later. Joining us is Professor Adnan Hussein. He is the host of the Mudgeless podcast. I'm going to ask who's on that this week. And of course, Guerrilla History. Okay. Guerrilla History with Henry Huckamacki. He is also chairman of the Religion Department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And let's talk briefly about the truckers. I am getting uh, emails from certain people accusing them of being undemocratic, of being tools of the right wing. Professor, uh, Dr. Harriet Fraud was just saying the left should be embracing the truckers. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, the left should be uh, embracing activist labor struggle. Uh, they should be foregrounding worker conditions. Um, and I think if we want to call into question some of the uh, aspects of the public health mandates, the real focus of those should be on the fact that governments have not prepared the conditions that are necessary for people to observe and uh, obey them without you know financial losses and all kinds of um, other issues and problems and consequences that have really been kind of off the table uh, you know i'm thinking about here in uh, ontario and in canada more broadly we've had two years to prepare schools to be better ventilated to have smaller classrooms to provide ppe uh, by the you know school districts uh, to all of the employees and students, um, it seems as if mask you know there was a mask shortage you know for a little while uh, during the o Omicron surge, and that there was just this assumption that vaccination would solve all problems and that would be the cheapest solution, you know rather than doing the structural things that are necessary. I mean from the very beginning of the pandemic. You know, it's been a fight to get sick days, you know, um, paid sick leave in Ontario. It's been difficult to get a hold of PPE, you know, masks and other things. Everyone's had to finance these pretty much themselves. And so there are clearly a lot of things the government could have done if it wanted to have its citizens obey public health mandates. Um, of course, we're not even talking about UBI and, you know, all of those. I mean, we had some sort of a program here in Canada was a little bit better than in the United States, but still nothing like what was sufficient. So I think the left critique has to be not just focusing on the mandates uh, and those difficulties with public health strictures that people are tired of, acknowledge that they're tired of it and demand that the government actually address the conditions that are needed to make it possible for people to weather the pandemic adhering to these public health mandates without, you know, their kids never getting, you know, a chance to get a proper schooling um, or to feel that they are safe. Uh, I think that's the real crux of it. The actual truckers themselves, however, if you want, maybe we should start putting truckers uh, in quotation marks because it doesn't necessarily represent the trucking industry as a whole, either the professional kind of organizations or the unions and associations or really frontline actual truckers, the vast majority of whom are, you know, vaccinated. 90 percent. Uh, yeah, 90 percent. So who exactly um, is this, uh, you know, representing and what kind of political goals? When you look at that a little bit more carefully, you see that it was these you know, kind of breakaway Western parties, far right sorts of groups that have used the anger, uh, frustration and inequities of the pandemic uh, to rally around um, a very abstract and individualized idea of freedom um, to achieve a political purpose of trying to bring down the Trudeau government. And hey, I'm with you. You know, I would love to see the Trudeau government and its neoliberal policies um, dissolve and in its place, um, you know, a, a government that actually cares uh, about workers. Um, but I don't see that as the design of these protests. So, so while Trudeau, I have to, I as I understand these, we've got to be very careful about how we support them. Trudeau accused these truckers of being racist and of being uh, not too bright. 
instead it's almost of, as if they were going around in blackface right know? yes like mr trudeau got away with so i think bernie would have said well what would bernie have said if he were the prime minister of canada how would he address what would be the because he would he would say these people are aggrieved they are channeling their frustration against the wrong organizations they're being exploited by the people they drive for and we want to help them we 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 support them they need more money they need better medical plans and we support the truckers and he would go out there and meet with them and listen to them and hear their complaints and show solidarity with them I think that's right I mean I think one of the problems is that um Trudeau was very dismissive at the beginning um and you know really didn't acknowledge that there might be some genuine uh, grievances and frustrations earlier this last week um he made a speech that um, seemed to at least rhetorically be a little bit better at acknowledging that everyone is really tired with, uh, you know, the pandemic. Um, so instead of just, um, you know, doing the kind of uh, <clears throat> moral shaming, you know, these people are violators and they're not able to adhere to something you know standards that we're all adhering to and make them you know this excluded uh shameful um you know group uh, you know acknowledge that everyone is really tired by the perduring of the of the pandemic and um but then as he tried to do, it was just rhetorical, is tried to say, well, you know, that's why we had to come together. And that's what most people have done is try and come together um, and protect one another. Um, but of course, the missing component, because he's uh, just a pure neoliberal, is and what can government do to help people right. adhere to these things? And I think Bernie would have, as you said, addressed those grievances, shown solidarity, would have met early on, gone out, acknowledged that this was a long running kind of set of grievances, not just because of the pandemic, but because of changes in the trucking industry. Um, and championed getting a fair deal for truckers. And I think right. that might have really um, changed the direction of this. Now it's become a complete culture war, of course. And so you right. have protests and counter protests over the weekend. Kingston, my town itself, had a slow convoy that went through the downtown honking and so on, including uh, an, a, you know, a protest that was to take place in front of City Hall. Uh, showing support for the convoy and um, the repeal of all the local health mandates that we have. And there appeared a counter protest of about 100 to 200 people that actually blocked the convoy. And I think that's what we're ending up getting is this kind of political battle rather than addressing the real issues. Um, yeah, as far I as I imagine, I, I remember Bernie on Fox that one time with Brett Baer. It was and, terrific, yeah. And, and I, I, it was in Pennsylvania. And it was almost as though he was being, we, we had said, it looked like Fox was setting him up because <laughs> they wanted him to get the nomination. But I, you don't, he, he, you don't set Bernie up. He's right. And if you give him a, pla I think his platform on Fox was the only place where he actually got to state what he was for. And I could see him saying to the truckers, look, I'm not going to discuss the vaccines with you. You're not scientists. You're, you're not doctors. Uh, I, I'm not going to, this is not up for discussion. You need to get vaccinated and that's it. What I will discuss with you is trucking and, the, and what, what you're going through and how do I put more money into your pockets and make sure that you're uh, being taken care of the truckers the uh, 90 percent of the truckers are vaccinated 90 percent of the truckers would support that the power in labor the power in unions is terrifying does it send a chill down your spine when you think of how easy it would be oh, yeah 
for labor to just <clears throat> grab hold of the power. I, I keep bringing this up. One bridge mm -hmm. is three hundred and fifty million dollars a day. Yeah, and winds are between Windsor and Detroit. Leftist? Yeah, does this scare you as a leftist? Where you go, oh my god, there's so much power in the union. All we need to do is exercise it. Well, the system is so fragile in some ways. I mean, we should know that because of, you know, what happened when the Evergrande, you know, ran aground in the Suez Canal and immediately you have price spikes and shortages exacerbating the problems already because of uh, disruptions of production during the pandemic. Then you had the shipping and transport. Um, this just-in-time distribution networks are meant to have very little slack, very little redundancy because those are costly and you go for the absolute most efficient, but that assumes everything goes right. And so it seems like there are all of these choke points in the global distribution network that dock workers, truckers, uh, rail workers could so easily disrupt the entire system i just think that the emergency powers act would have been invoked a lot earlier i mean you know trudeau just invoked the emergency powers act um, um you know a couple of weeks ago if it was genuinely targeted wide scale and with a workers agenda i think um we might have seen a lot quicker action by you know the government to protect those industries and that's what i'm Kind of concerned about but obviously labor needs to start testing in a more direct way um corporations and the governments that are absolutely beholden you know to corporate interests with precisely that instead what we've got is uh you know uh, uh sort of Lollapalooza, you know kind of situation <laughs> you know it's a kind of party out there with no real demands. I mean, the demands that they're making are like these wild political demands of dissolving the government and putting in place some new committee with the Senate and getting the governor general to declare, you know, the, the government prorogued. I mean, it's all zany, fantastical. And even if you, if you read the um, actual petition or document that they have, it's got faux legalism, it, it sounds, so strange and unrealistic to be honest um those aren't demands those aren't real demands um, well, the cia infiltrated the left to come up with these ideas well yeah we've seen you know uh, uh you know the uh the um historic uh guidelines for how to infiltrate from the cia the 10 things you should do um but i you know what's interesting oh, I, about I, I haven't seen that what is that Oh, uh, there's like a, a document that's circular. I'm forgetting exactly the details um, of it, but I, I read it about a year or so ago, and it's something from, I think the 19, uh, it might even be the late 1950s, and it's a document about basically trying to disrupt, um, you know, left movements, how to, um, you know, obfuscate about process and, you know, make everything really slow and difficult to agree on you know propose kind of more extreme you know suggestions um you know so there was a whole variety of techniques in order to fragment and defer coalescing around a clear agenda that could be achieved uh in order to undermine these 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 groups it gets, and i get I, I apologize for getting animated here but the dirty word is money. They want one thing, the other side, money. And they use that. That's their weapon, money, because that they get power and money. If we're not fighting for the same thing as they are, it's like playing football and they're going after the football and we're going after a hockey puck it's just you have to go after the same ball that that they that they want we're not going after the same ball we, we it, we've complicated everything it should be money we want their money why can't we get a politician who will just, like bernie who will just say we're coming for your money we want your money that's what we want why can't we say that? 
Well, I, I, you know, Bernie did say that. And, you know, uh, what happened to him? I mean, it was very clear he was about uh, increasing taxation on on the rich and um, delegitimizing the idea that if you have a billion dollars, it actually really belongs to you. I think he was doing quite a good job with this absolute focus on the 1%, upon the billionaires, uh, to suggest that had to be re redistributed. I mean, I think it was very clear, and that's why um, some people were quite, um, I guess, uh, uh, unnerved and um, concerned um, because they thought such a message wouldn't be popular and thus he wouldn't beat Trump. Others were genuinely concerned because it was going to target them and those who uh, they were, you know, receiving their support from, uh, like the establishment politicians. And between the two of them, uh, between those two groups on um, the progressive or centrist uh, left, um, you ended up having uh, people lose their nerves. I mean, it would have been interesting. This is what I, we always wanted, is at least to see a genuine confrontation between the agenda of the left articulated clearly, directly in just that way, we want your money, and the agenda of the right. And let's you know see what would end up happening um, in a fair, well, I'm not saying that you know the electoral situation would have ended up being fair but it was much better it would have been much more edifying for the american public uh to have that be the confrontation in the in the main election rather than it being kind of sidelined and corralled in the internal primary uh, discourse i mean that needed an airing broadly in society i and remember joe the plumber uh talking and cornering then candidate Barack Obama and Joe the plumber was taking him on and Obama made the mistake of saying well you know there's a lot of money and power at the top and you know you want to spread it around a little distribute it make sure everybody gets some money and then he had to walk that back and say and say I don't believe in the redistribution of money or power so here you have a democratic candidate in 2008 saying i don't believe in the redistribution of wealth meanwhile joe the plumber became a right-wing uh, hero who went belly up had no money uh, but uh you can't even get a democrat to say he's in favor of redistribution of the wealth how is that wrong how did that become a bad thing to say well when they moved away from close association with labor and um, neoliberal policies themselves starting with I guess uh, professor Harvey JK would tell us with Carter you know um, they shifted in their support you know they were not being um, responsive or responsible to labor unions and they did everything um, to facilitate along with the uh, right wing, you know, governments under Reagan and and the two Bushes. But there wasn't a lot of change in the interim with, you know, Clinton's and Obama's starting with Carter. So you have uh, 40 years of undermining, you know, labor's power. Um, that's the only institution on a sort of civic and social level that was dedicated to redistribution in an organized way. Um, so politically speaking, there just hasn't been anything other than, in a rhetorical sense, value there. Um, and on the other hand, there's been such a reinforcing of this, uh, you know, language around um, opportunity. I mean, that's even what the Democrats talk about. No one talks about actual material benefits. They talk about opportunity. You know, oh, you know, and this was the, the this was what. Uh, Clinton re reoriented when he did welfare reform, he started talking instead about opportunity in society. And this is where we get this idea that if we create uh, a level playing field, as if that's, you know, possible in a market, you know, economy where there's already inequity, that everyone should have the opportunity to succeed. And that way, it's up to them and it's not really anybody else's responsibility. It's not our collective responsibility. It's not our institutions through government that have to ensure those outcomes. That's up to the individuals. And if you fail, that is your fault that you are failing. Um, right. 
I think is the problem. Yeah, it's like. But it, I did. Well, I did want to bring up something about you mentioned at the very outset um, this criticism of the trucker convoys as anti-democratic, as leading to authoritarianism, which of course is counter to their way of framing their interests around freedom. So I think that's right, right. part of the reason why they're trying to say you're not being democratic, you're not actually in favor of freedom. Um, but I'm not sure that's the greatest uh, you know, argument. I think the, the main point that they're trying to get at uh, that might have some local benefit within ca Canadian political culture is the fact that this is mostly foreign funding, or at least about, you know, half of the donations are coming from the U.S. and there are some small percentages from other countries around the world, mostly Europe, um, but something like 30 or 40 percent, um, you know, are Canadian uh, donations. Uh, but it's about equivalent in terms of the amount of money. Uh, that's coming from donations outside and this is just for uh, this isn't from gofundme this is the second round with the other um i think it's uh, go send um something i can't remember the ac exact name of the uh of of the the funding platform uh but it's oh give send go um, um that there's been a leak a hacker seems to have gotten the um information about donations and circulated these um so that's why we have these and and you can hear the right saying the hacker should be arrested not the trucker you have ted cruz and Rand paul supporting the illegal shutdown of a bridge that they're okay with but the hacker who hacks their uh charity they should that guy should be arrested yeah yeah exactly um you know so what we've we found is that uh of the ninety two thousand eight hundred and forty four donations fifty six percent fifty one thousand six hundred and sixty six came from the u s twenty nine percent came from canada and uh one thousand eight hundred and thirty one or two percent from the from the u k um and you know so when i think putin, when is putin gonna stop meddling in the yeah, this is the point is that that i think this is so christia freeland um who's pro who's i think grandfather was a ukrainian neo-nazi during world war ii um is trying to characterize so she's the foreign minister you know minister of foreign affairs is trying to characterize this as interference right in our domestic uh, elections by authoritarians she's trying to invoke a sense that it's those nefarious forces of authoritarian governments abroad uh, without acknowledging and being clear most of this is coming from U.S. Uh, sources, you know, so this is not coming from Russia or, you know, authoritarians in Eastern, you know, Europe or, you know, some, some other far flung land. This is, uh, you know, coming from mostly from the United States um, and that there are some people who have even been traveling up to try and join the protests from the U.S. They've been turned back at the border recently. Um, so. I'm a little cautious about how you invoke um, this sort of discourse about authoritarianism is what's behind it, because typically that's being used uh, to obfuscate the fact that this is coming from, from the US. Whereas I think that is actually what would galvanize the Canadian public with their sort of nationalist kind of uh, you know sense of identity um, to want uh, to avoid the importation of Trump-like far-right politics into Canada, although we have plenty of it ourselves, but you know mainstream Canadians um, will object if they think that the U.S. is actually interfering in Canadian politics. That would be much better by being clear about that and acknowledging that most of these donations are coming from U.S. sources than to just broadly talk about anti-democratic forces and the specter of authoritarianism, because that vagueness is exactly what they're using to hype up conflict now with Russia and so on. Right. Professor Adnan Hussein, let's very quickly plug Rahima.org. 
Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Rahima.org, uh, local uh, Bay Area foundation that provides support, uh, food, other kinds of assistant, uh, assistance, rent support um, to people in the South Bay. Um, it's open to all. It started, however, with uh, refugees coming from Afghanistan and then later Somalia, Bosnia. There have been successive waves, of course, Syrians, Iraqis, and so on. But it's an organization uh, my mother founded in our garage about 30 years ago, and uh, she's still going strong. And any help and support people can give will uh, go to um, assisting people who are the most desperate and most in need, um, particularly during this pandemic where uh, there have been so many other challenges and disruptions. Uh, they've continued to work and operate and distribute food and other uh, monetary assistance uh, to people who, who really need the help. So um, if you can chip in a few bucks, go to rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A dot O-R-G, and um, make a donation. And it's good food, by the way. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Very quickly, who's on Mudgeless podcast and who's on? Well, coming up this, uh, you know, later this month, we'll have Juan Cole talking about this new book that he's edited with a number of essays, important and interesting studies, Peace Movements in Islam, History, Religion, and Politics. And so we'll talk to him about about that uh, about that book. And um, also check out our. Uh, recent episode on guerrilla history discussing uh, Edward Said's representations of the intellectual, a very interesting and important book um, from the late, great uh, Edward Said. Palestinian scholar and pianist. That's right. That's right. Your pianist. He was an, uh, apparently, I never actually heard him play piano, but he was apparently maybe not quite concert level, but very, very close. Uh, he was a, a, a real virtuoso and loved music and was a great a great music critic in the nation, actually. He wrote uh, powerfully about opera and, and music, um, about Glenn Gould, for example. I remember reading some essays about of his about Glenn Gould. So he was a really multi-talented public intellectual who knew how to write in a clear way uh, for a public audience and was very much against the specialization, the use of jargon in literary criticism, uh, he thought you needed to really communicate what was powerful about art, music, and above all, politics. It's exclusionary, the, the way some academics write. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Yeah.